Isabel West Fisher. I am the Youth Services Librarian here at the St. John's Ferry Athenaeum. From time to time, I try and do a social studies type of emphasis. Um, just, it's fun. It's a uh, homeschoolers benefit from it, and I, it's usually on a topic that spans the ages. Uh, today, I'm really happy to be um, presenting Abenaki Stories. Uh, Beth Champagne is our storyteller extraordinaire. And just to let you know a little bit about Beth, um, she was destined to be a Vermonter because even at an early age, I think around 11, she visited Vermont and she just kind of adopted the state as her own. And aren't we fortunate that she did choose Vermont for her home? Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Champagne. And welcome. To celebrate sugaring season, I'd like to share two stories. One of them is called Gluskabi and the Maples. But I'm guessing that most of you don't know a whole lot about who Gluskabi is or where he came from. So we're going to start with the coming of Gluskabi. And the way we start is like this. A long time ago, my story was walking around. A forest lodge man dressed in sheets of moss, belted with some ash wood. He decided to camp here. And this is where my story begins. After Tabaldak had finished making the first human beings, he dusted off his hands. And the dust of that clay <laughs> sifted down through the air, the sunlit air, and some of it sprinkled the ground. And from this dust, Luscavi made himself. Now, because he did this, some of the Abenaki people called him by another name, Adzihozo, which means the man who made himself from something. Luscavi did not have the powers of the creator, Tabaldak. But like his grandchildren, the human beings, he had the power to change things on Earth, sometimes for the worst. When Tabaldak saw Bluskabi and heard him say, here I am, as he stood up from the ground, he was astonished. How did it happen that you came to be here now, he asked. And Gluskabi said, I formed myself from the dust that you sprinkled on the ground. You're very wonderful, said Tabaldak. I am wonderful because you sprinkled me, answered Luscavi. Let us roam around, said Tabaldak. They set off uphill and walked and walked, always climbing, until they reached the top of a mountain. And they looked out. They could see so far and wide, eyes open. They could see lakes 
and rivers and trees, the lay of the land, the earth. And to Baldock said to Guscavi, by the wish of my mind, I created all this. Behold, even the oceans, the river lakes, the rivers, I have created it. I wonder, said Pliscobi, if I too could cause something to come into being. Make whatever you can do according to your powers, answered Tabaldak. Perhaps I could make the wind, said Pliscobi. And he did. The wind blew harder and harder until trees began to bend over and some trees were torn up by the roots. Glaskabi was very pleased. <laughs> Enough, said Tabaldak. I have seen what you can do and I know now your powers. In return, let me make the wind blow. And the wind came on so strong, Blaskabi could not stand up. And as he lay on the ground, the wind tangled his long hair. But when he went to untangle it, the wind blew his hair all off. Enough, said Blaskabi. Now I know what your powers are. No more will I cause something to come into being. And so, Tabala reminded Guscabi that he had a job to do on Earth to make life good for his grandchildren, the human beings. And Glaskabi set out just to do that. I say, hey, you say, ho. Oh. 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 Hey, ho. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the Abnaki told most of their, well, really, they, they, they had a specific season for storytelling which was the winter, when nights were long and working outdoors wasn't the thing to do. So in order to make sure that everyone, especially the children, was still with him, the storyteller would say, hey, ho, <laughs> now. Long, long, long times passed. Hundreds and thousands of years. And our story is not from when the world was brand new. It's when the people had villages all around. But Muscavi's work was the same to make life good for his grandchildren, the human beings. So our, in, the, in our story of Gluskabi and the maples, Gluskabi's just out enjoying a walk in the not quite spring weather. And he says to himself, I think I better check on my grandchildren. Sure enough, it's not too long before he comes to a village. It's very strange. No dog barks. He cannot smell the smoke of a fire. And when he looks at the lodges that the people live in, they're not being taken care of. The fire is out. He can't see anyone around. But Pliskabi was not going to give up. First, he walked all the way to the lake, but 
No one was there fishing in the lake. He checked the streams. Still no one fishing. Then he did a great long walk through the forest, but found no hunters. Heading back toward the village, he stopped at the field. No one was hoeing. The weeds were growing thick in the corn and beans and squash that would be an important part of the people's winter food. There was not even anyone gathering berries on the edges of the field where they were ripening. When he got back to the village, he thought again. No one is weaving baskets. No one is tanning hides. No one is flattening porcupine quills to color, to put on in their clothing in beautiful patterns when they make their deerskin clothing. Then, as he stood, he could just barely catch a sound, <gasps> like that, a very soft sound, a sound of happiness. And he went in that direction, up the hill on the other side of the village, to the very top, looked down, and there was the maple grove. And what did he see but all the people lying on their backs like this with their eyes about closed and their mouths wide open. Every single one of them was catching drips of maple syrup that came from a twig the end of a branch where they'd broken the twig off. Oh, oh, said Gustavi. This cannot stand. He turned around, climbed the hill, went through the village, went back into the woods until he found the right birch tree and gathered birch bark and fashioned a large basket. When you make a birch bark basket, it's not all woven with little strips, okay? It's sheets of birch bark, and he had to sew it together, and he used the cordage made from the basswood tree, the linden tree. And then, to make it completely watertight, he took pine pitch to seal up those seams. And walked on down to the lake and blew on the basket. And the basket became much bigger. He also took a deep, deep breath so that he too became much bigger. He was twice his normal height. Then he blew again on the basket, which of course was really going to work as a bucket. And he took another deep breath and he was almost as tall as a tree. The third time he did it, his bucket was immense and his height was as tall as the tallest maple tree. Now, into the water, fill that bucket, carry it back the trail to the village, up the hill, down the hill. The people are still lying as they were before on the ground. When Gluskabi begins to sprinkle that water on the tops of all of the maple trees, When he did that, gradually that syrup that was coming out of the broken twigs changed to sap with just a tiny bit of sweet taste. And as Glusabi 
let out his breaths, and brought himself back to his normal size. He started hearing the people say, where has our sweet drink gone? And Glascabi answered, no longer will maple syrup come for you from the twig of a tree. Things are out of balance here. From now on, you will gather sap from the tree, and only at one special time of the year. You will have to chop wood to make fires, and you will have to collect birch bark to make buckets. Into those buckets full of sap, you will put hot stones, stones you've gathered, the special stones that are safe and don't explode, you will put hot stones into those buckets of sap again and again and again as that sap boils down until finally you will have syrup. This way, you will have time to do all of the other things that people need to do. And so it is to this day. Here my story ends. <laughs> My name is Justin Thunderbear, and uh, I'd like to say uh, greetings to you, and uh, kwai kwai to all of you, nido ba, that means hello my friends, that's our language, it's called, our language is called the Algonquin language, and as what I said is kwai kwai, nido ba, hello my friends, and welcome. Thank you very much for coming and for sharing. As Adele hinted, I discovered Vermont when I was about 11 and announced to myself, I'm going to live here when I grow up. <clears throat> I then forgot all about that and came and lived here. And I was in my late 40s when my father let it be known that his father, Alfred Onassim Champagne, who always spoke French with his wife when they didn't want the children to understand back in the early part of the 20th century, was not French, as I thought. Pepe was an Indian. And what happened when I found that news out was that for the first time in my life, everything about my childhood made sense. And so I just invite you to make any comments or ask any questions. Um, as you know, many, many people have mixed heritage, and that includes some people who, along with their European heritage, have Indian heritage, like me. Is there anything you're curious about or you would just like to share? Answer that question. Perhaps my guest here could. Uh, yes, there is. There, there are many nations of the Abenaki that are uh, all over Vermont and uh, Canada and uh, Maine. And can you speak to the difference between, or I should say, the similar, the, the belonging of Abenaki within the larger Algonquin? He was asking Algonquin. Uh, yeah, Algonquin, Algonquins are related to the Abenaki lang language wise. They speak the same language, and they also same. The, they also share the same customs and beliefs with the Abenaki. Yeah, I'm from the.
Clan of the Hawk in Evansville, which is a tribe that, um, of, Kalis, of the Kalisak Nation. There's many nations of the Abenaki. There's the Siskoi, the Kalisaks, there's the uh, Sokopis from Massachusetts, and there's a Penobscot. Uh, what about the Elnu? The Elnu, yeah. They're, they're also a uh, Kalisak Nation. Um, I'm from the Coas Kalisak Nation, from, uh, from uh, usually from the Newberry area. And uh, I used to, I used to belong to the Siskoi tribe, but then I moved up here um, to Vermont and joined, decided to join the Clan of the Hawk. And that's the tribe I'm um, affiliated with now. There, there's 13 nations in all of the other. How many? 13. 13 nations in all. Yeah. And Joseph Bruchard always says, uh, uh, the turtle, the turtle, the turtle. Um, if you look in the back of the turtle shell, you notice that there's there's always 13 plates in the back of the turtle shell. And he said, and he said that um, the 13 plates in the turtle shell also stands for the 13 nations of the Abenaki, and also the 13 plates on the shell also serve as a calendar. On the outside of the shell, there are 28 there are 28 plates, which represents the 28 days in, of the moon. And so the turtle and the and the thirteen represents the months, co which are counted as moon cycles of the moon, yep. thirteen in one year. Yep. And uh, of course, you may have heard of the Turtle Island Child Care Center in Montpelier, and that's also referring to an ancient Abnaki story of the turtle creating the, the, earth. the earth. That's why it's called Turtle Island. Yeah. Are the thirteen are they traditional? Or are they are they still in existence? They're still in existence today. Yeah. So I will share with you that there's a book um, which Adele has in the children's library called Malion Song. It's produced by the Vermont Folk Life Center and. Mali Yon, which you just say like Mali Yon, is the Abnaki pronunciation of the name Marion. The Abnaki do not have that R sound in their ordinary voc vocabulary. Um, and Jeannie Brick, who teaches Abnaki language in, in Barry, um, told me how very hard she had to work to be able to pronounce her married last name, Brink. Okay? But Malion's story is of interest because it shows you how the Abnaki were received in Canada when the English were driving them out so that they could have this land for themselves. It's also tells a dramatic story of Roger's raid, which a lot of us have learned something about in school. And I, I can't remember how I did find out right this second, but it turns out that the Abnaki story of Roger's raid was passed down over 250 years from 1759, the year it happened, until amazingly, exactly 200 years later, 1959, Gordon Day, a brilliant man from Barry, Vermont, who studied to become a forester, worked in northern New Hampshire, was so impressed with what he learned about how the Abnaki people managed the forests to be productive and healthy, that he returned to university all over again and became an ethnologist, in other words, somebody who studies another people of another place and time, and had learned Abnaki so well that he was getting stories from the people up in Canada in the village called Odenak and how he discovered the Abomsowin family in Berlin, the town right next to Barry, I don't know. But 
I mentioned Jeannie Brink. Jeannie's grandmother had received this story and had never shared it. It was traditional to teach a child a story that was part of your people's history and to teach it really well so that that person in adult years could pass it on to someone much younger. And indeed, Jeannie's grandmother was only the third person ever to have known this story and the Folk Life Center got the story from her. Um, so I, I do want you to know that this is a great storybook with lovely illustrations um, in which you can learn more about Abnaki people and their life before the modern time. <laughs>